Willpower is an incredibly powerful tool for human evolution and, and personal change. You lose the energy to do it properly and then you start just tumbling off a cliff that way. Fruit, I should say, is junk food. When I eat, I don't do anything else. I just focus on my food. The easier life gets, the harder it becomes to live. I'm super pumped to welcome you to today's episode. I'm thrilled to introduce you to my friend and an extraordinary personality, Eric Edmeets. Eric is someone I've been fortunate enough to connect with on several occasions. And trust me when I say this, our conversations are always fascinating. So diving right in, Eric is a man of many hats. As a food psychologist and a nutritional anthropologist, he's redefining our relationship with food. Through Wildfit, his brainchild, and the globally celebrated health transformation program, he's making a real impact on people's lives. And aside from his food revolution, Eric is a seasoned entrepreneur and a powerhouse speaker, and he shared stages with heavyweights like Richard Branson, Robin Sharma, and even President Bill Clinton. His stage presence is so magnetic that he's gone on to launch his own speaking academy, sharing his knowledge and expertise with the world. But what I find most intriguing about Eric is his recognition as an unsung hero by the Canadian Senate. And this one is a tale for the books, so I cannot wait for Eric to share it with us today. So without any further ado, let's dive right into today's insightful conversation with the one and only Eric Edmeets. What did the Canadian Senate award you for and what's the story behind that? I guess the story behind that is that uh, it starts with the Canadian Senate having their 150th anniversary and, um, and somewhere along the line they decided that they wanted to strike a medal to recognize, I think the way they put it was they wanted to recognize unsung heroes, you know, people that were uh, doing great work, but not necessarily standing up on a big soapbox and talking about it, or what have you. And and at that stage, Wildfit had just really started to take off in a big way. And I know that um, uh, one of the senators in Canada had gotten a t uh, got, uh, become interested in our work. And the next thing you know, I got this letter, and I have to fly to Ottawa and go and visit Parliament, and you know, head into the Senate and. Um, sit through a session of, of the Senate, which was fascinating to watch. And then, and then uh, the Speaker of the Senate and the Senator presented me with this medal. And they said that it was on the basis of the, um, it was on the basis of the work that I'm doing, helping people improve the quality of their lives. And for me, it's been really fascinating because all, it, it was almost like at that point in time, Wildfit was sort of moving from like, you know, quite busy hobby to quite serious project, quite serious business. That day really almost made me feel responsible. It's like, you you better do something with this. So yeah, it was, it was a neat day. But what's the idea behind Wildfit? Where did Wildfit come from? It's a complicated question because um, years and years ago, when I first started discovering some core principles about nutrition that I thought were valuable, um, I, I, I recognized that diet books don't work. And so I thought, like finding this information is just about pointless because what am I going to do, write yet another book that doesn't work? And so while the nutritional principles were really solid and inspired by evolutionary biology or what you might call nutritional anthropology, the problem is, is that there's a very small percentage of the population that can like receive a bunch of nutrition rules and follow them or follow them for any length of time. So some people are done within a week. I mean, the average person sticks to a diet for about six days. So, and then, and some people can hold on for a few weeks and some people for a few months, but even some of the people that hold on for six or more months end up relapsing. And that's just a recurring theme that we've seen over and over again. So I started doing some, you know, deep dive into the psych psychological components of food, like why people eat what they eat, eat when, even when they don't want to, like even when there's a voice in the back of their head screen, don't do it, don't do it. Like, why are they still doing that? Or, or they know that there's a consequence coming. Why do they still do that? That really led me into this intersection of really solid nutritional anthropology, good nutrition principles that if people could stick to them would really work. But then it got to the next part and that was how to get those principles to stick to them instead of asking them to stick to the principles. And when I married those things together, that's ultimately what what created the first WildFit Challenge. And it was wildly successful. I, I, I took the first eight clients through the program in, in what you might call pre-beta and got like 
results from every single one of them. And so then we did more and, you know, ate more and then ate more. And then pretty soon the word of mouth was spreading. And the next thing you know, we're having to do classes with like 100 or 200 people in them. And then within about four months of that, it had transitioned to classes with like 1,100 people in them. And so to date, we've had something like 50,000 people do our full program over the course of you know, since we started and, and they're in a hundred some odd countries. So it's been really interesting to see the cultural impact of that as well. And you say anthropology, but it's not just a buzzword here. You actually go and live with these people, these uh, tribes of people and study how they live and what they eat. Yeah. I mean, I, I thought of it as nutritional anthropology long before I did that. There's a great deal one can learn about, you know, human history from books and from theory. My, my, Great grandfather discovered the oldest sapien, o- oldest uh, sapien skull in history, and, and at about two hundred and fifty nine thousand years old. And so I've been fascinated by that kind of stuff for a long, long time. You know, since I was about twelve. But yeah, it, uh, about fifteen years ago, I was offered the opportunity to go and visit with the Hadza people in East Africa, which have more recently been kind of popularized. I think Joe Rogan's been talking about mm-hmm. them and stuff like that. Uh, actually, he had Paul Saladino on his podcast, and Paul was talking about his time out there with the Bushmen. Well, I took Paul. I've been visiting them for about fifteen years, and obviously, their life has changed a lot in the last fifteen years. But when I even even now, you can see. Um, I wouldn't want to over romanticize it and suggest that like that's you know their lifestyle is representational of our ancestral lifestyle, but I think it is fair to say that their lifestyle is the closest representation we have to our ancestral lifestyle. And of course, 15 years ago, it was even more so. So yeah, I've been pretty dedicated to uh, getting to the bottom of of a lot of the questions I had about food and health. But what are the principles then behind Wildfit? Because it's not a diet. No, no, I you know look. Diet is one of these words that kind of got hijacked. The evolution of language is pretty interesting. Uh, Richard Dawkins, you know, today's evolution guy, um, he created a word one day. Uh, he created the word meme. And he created the word meme, the word meme as a representation of ideas metaphorically represented as a gene. In other words, an idea pops up in society and through the process of natural selection, that idea will either die off or it'll it'll move forward and what's funny is is that he he kind of came up with this theory and then a lot of the a lot of people generally uh, shot the idea down and you know said that mimology was a pseudoscience or what have you but what's really funny about it is if you think about it i mean now the word meme it's in regular everyday use but it also doesn't mean anymore what he intended it to mean it now means stupid silly little photograph that teenagers send each other on their phones right like so meme has evolved, which in a weird twist actually proves his theory that, um, you know, his idea, his word went into the, the public use and survived in the public use and continued to breed so that it became widespread use. And, and then from that widespread use, it began to evolve. And now the meaning has evolved. Now, this is a long roundabout way of saying the same thing happened to the word diet. If you were to tune into, you know, any nature show and you hear the announcer come on there and he's like talking about, elephants and he's going to here we have the african elephant loxodonta africana its diet consists of 200 kilograms you know it's it mm-hmm. it, it, it it's diet it, its diet is a specific thing it's not like and this here elephant is on a diet you know like <laughs> it, no no it has a diet and and in the same way the elephant has a diet the dung beetle has a diet and the earthworm has a diet and the cheetah has a diet so in in science in ecology diet has a specific meaning it means lifestyle and we've kind of twisted that into lifestyle relative to nutrition. Mm. But now the diet industry came along and said, well, no, we're going to create this new thing. Diet now means temporary alteration to your normal day-to-day eating patterns in order to achieve some short-term goal. In that respect, no, they don't work. The science is on, on that is really clear. Like the average person will go on something like 100 plus diets in their lifetime. They'll go on about two a year. They'll stick to each one for about six days. And most of them will gain weight every time they go on a diet to lose weight. Yeah, It's even like the show, The Biggest Loser, yeah. where they uh, did their crazy diets, crazy exercises, but when they followed up, let's say a year or two later, they many become people, the biggest most, gainer. Exactly, yeah. They, yeah. they gained even more than they lost in the first place. I actually um, had a conversation, an off-the-record conversation, so I can't name the one that it was, but one of the contestants from The Biggest Loser had lost all this weight, but you know, ended up putting it all back on. And I had a conversation with him, and I said, look, you know, I will run you through Wildfit. And you will 
completely change your relationship with food and you know you, you will make a measurable impact to your your lifestyle things will change permanently and his response to me was at that stage he, he said sure i'll do it but you got to pay me 20 grand and i said no i'm 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 saying if you want to do it you're gonna have to pay me but i'm never going to tell anybody you did it i i'm not doing this for pu publicity if you mm -hmm. decide of your own volition to go out and talk to people about wild fit as your as your vehicle of turnaround that's all fine and if after the program you want to talk about a sponsorship deal we'll talk about it but i'm not paying you to do the program mm -hmm. and he's like oh yeah i know but but you know these other guys will and so we're in this bizarre place now where the bigger victim you are, the more money you can make. And so some people just don't want to recover. That is very strange. But I guess people and programs are coming to them with offers like this. Yep. Hey, you went through the show, you want to do ours? Maybe you'll lose more weight this time. Yeah, and then I hate to say it, but there's the built-in incentive to regain the weight and do the whole thing exactly, again. Exactly, yeah. So. And to say that the previous one didn't work. Yeah. You have to add into the contract the side note that you cannot regain the weight. <laughs> there you go. But do you think the reason that they regained the weight is because of habits and they, they didn't uh, build a long enough habit? Or would it be that such drastic weight loss in a such short period of time, it just did something to their metabolism? So do you think it's like uh, biochemical or is it like more of a human it's, habit thing? It's different in every case. I mean, there's, there's a few reasons for relapse. Um, one is this, that it's very popular these days to say that willpower doesn't work. The truth is willpower works just fine. Willpower is an incredibly powerful tool, tool for you know, human evolution and, and personal change, but it's a misunderstood tool. And people, people think that they can use willpower to, um, to create massive changes in their life. And what willpower is really there to do is to create small incremental improvements and small incremental changes and well this is the best way to describe it is that right now your heart is beating and you can't do much to change the pulse of it except to put a bigger strain on the heart you can't think it faster you can't just you know maybe if you're like a you know tai chi master or zen buddhist monk you can do it but for most of us we can't just go okay beat faster it's not available but breathing is different breathing is a semi-conscious behavior we can completely unconsciously breathe but we can also consciously breathe and so that means that i can ask you right now to hold your breath and you would and you could use willpower to hold your breath, right? Mm -hmm. But then how long would that willpower last? Until I run out of oxygen. Yeah, like roughly, you know, can you get out to a minute? Maybe a yeah. minute and a half? I could probably do more. There you go. But there's going to be a point sometime between a minute and a half and probably two minutes where your body is going to override your willpower. Mm -hmm. And that would be true even if this room was full of smoke. Mm -hmm. Even if this room is full of toxic, rubbish, poisonous smoke, and you consciously knew that sometime around about the two minute mark, depending on the training you've done for breathing, your body will force you to breathe in anyway. Consciousness doesn't matter. Logical awareness doesn't matter. At that point, the body's survival instinct is going to override your willpower. Now, when you take somebody who's been overeating for a very long time, for example, and likely overeating very low quality things what happens is that they start using willpower to not eat that which is like holding their breath so they're like <gasps> not gonna eat not gonna mm. eat not gonna eat and there's they're, then they go into deep calorie restriction and all of a sudden the body goes hell no i'm starving i'm overriding this and i'm going to force you to breathe whatever food in you can find it's exactly the same mechanism so whenever we use willpower we're we, we, misguided use of willpower we're gonna have a problem and then the next problem, as I've already mentioned in there, is calorie restriction. Calorie restriction is a terrible way to lose weight. It, it, it basically means starving yourself. It means t you know not putting in enough energy to run your basic daily metabolism, and so you, you start starving. Well, guess what? If you're starving, then your instincts are going to kick in, and you're going to lose control because the hungrier you get, the more flexible you become about your food rules. So think about that. You take somebody who's already got food rule problems, then put them on calorie restriction. They start feeling like they're starving to death. Pretty soon, somebody puts something in front of them. It's not a matter of temptation. They don't have a choice. And then on top of that, there are metabolism problems with that. One of my very good friends went through Wild Fit and did very well, took off a bunch of weight. But then she hit a plateau. And it's like, what's this plateau all about? What is this plateau all about? Well, a deep dive into her daily food consumption showed that as well as she had done, she still had a diet mentality about her about her portion size. Mm -hmm. So she was eating about half the daily calories she needed. Even though she was eating really well, she was eating half the daily calories. And so her body stopped releasing weight. Well, that doesn't make sense. 
if you're eating half the daily calories, you should be losing weight. No, the body gets the message. There's not a lot of food available and says, conserve, conserve, conserve. And you feel your energy going and your mood's going out of control and your metabolism messes. Uh, meantime, what did she do? She doubled her food. Then she started losing weight. I could keep going, but there's, there's a variety of these things where the diet industry has not only failed to work, but it's damaged us psychologically and even physiologically. And, and that's why I don't support. I mean, there are diets out there that are built on good principles. But again, if they're going to be rel reliant on willpower for the vast mm. majority of people, they're not going to work. And there's often so many negative feedback loops with these bad habits. You start doing something, you lose the energy to do it properly, and then yep. you start just falling, tumbling off a cliff that way. Yeah. But um, what are the principles then behind WildFit? How is WildFit different? How have you built it? Okay, well, if we start with the nutritional differences, um, you know, loosely speaking, WildFit probably belongs in the larger envelope of the paleo community. In fact, when I met Lauren Cordain, we, uh, I asked him what stimulated his thoughts around the paleo diet. And he told me that it was an article written by uh, Stanley Boyd Eaton. Uh, it was written in 1984, 1985, that, and it theorized that there was a human diet and the funny thing is i read that same article when it got published on the internet in like the mid in mid 90s the same article that stimulated paleo was the same article that got me thinking about wildfit long before there was any paleo but from that perspective the core nutritional principles are that we want to do what we can to eat in accordance with our evolved relationships with food. So that means foods that have been in longer human consumption are more likely to be um, necessary and are more, or, or are more likely to be good for us. And foods that have been introduced more recently are less likely to be necessary and more likely to be harmful to us. So that's one core principle. But then there are some other principles that aren't really don't really exist in the in the sort of paleo or keto kind of world and that is that humans evolved very intricate um uh, abilities to survive seasonal fluctuation and this was a very important evolution like if you consider it's so easy to take for granted now like regular food delivery and shelter and and all this kind of stuff but the truth is for the vast majority of our history our ancestors lived day to day not knowing about their food certainty. You know, they, it wasn't like that for them. And of course, when the seasons changed, that threw everything into the, into the air. So, you know, suddenly there's a drought, which, you know, the equivalent of winter, and there's not a lot of water, not a lot of plants, not a lot of plants, not a lot of hunting, and basically the whole thing goes bad. And at that point in time, if you have not evolved a metabolism that can kind of hibernate, you know, that can, that can, can generate energy for long periods of time, if you haven't evolved that, you're not going to make it through that winter. And of course, we did evolve that. But what, what, what people seem to not realize now is that we didn't evolve simply to survive those seasons, we evolved to utilize them. So there are important bodily functions that take place in each of those seasons. And today, people don't go through those seasons. They just don't. And as a consequence, there are important bodily functions that don't happen. If you take a look at somebody who's got, say, uh, pre-diabetes or, or type 2 diabetes, I don't think that's a disease. I don't see it as a disease at all. I see it as an injury, an injury of the pancreas, an injury of the, of the body in general terms, in terms of the way it processes sugar. But in one sense, the way to look at it is, is that that person's metabolism got stuck in a single season. And that was the season of prepare for winter. There's lots of carbohydrates in my life right now and prepare for winter. And it got stuck in that season. And then they got stuck in that mode. And we call that diabetes. So that seasonal fluctuation is a very important distinction that just doesn't really exist out there in the diet world. Now, separate from the nutrition side, we also do unique work in the psychology side. And that is um, helping people to break free of the manipulations of the food industry. The food industry has been manip manipulating our psychology and our metabolism for a very, very long time. And so a big part of the work that we do is about food psychology, breaking the linkages. Like there are people that are right now, you and I are here, they're probably eating it while they listen to us. There, there are people that eat things that they learn to eat when they are 10 or 11 or 12 and they linked up an emotional state to eating those things. And now they're 30 or 40 or 50 years old and they're still running that pattern. And so, you know, that's obviously an area that we spend a lot of work on is really helping people to reassess their um, relationships with food and break the psychological links that the, that the food industry created. The most helpful thing for me here from a food psychology point of view personally has been to avoid mindless eating yeah. in a sense, like when I'm doing something, when I'm watching something, 
I used to snack on things and I don't notice how much I eat. Now I have set periods of eating and set periods of doing things. And when I eat, I don't do anything else. I just focus on my food. Well, you get to enjoy it better that way. Yeah. And then also you get to um, connect with your satiation. You get exactly. to connect it's with your Exactly, it's way more fullness. satiating. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that has helped a lot. But but this is a good example. So like one of the things we have to help people understand is why they want to do that. Why do they want to eat while distracted? Why do they want to do that? I mean, if if food is yummy, why wouldn't you want to really focus on More that? dopamine. Well, dopamine, but also history. Hmm. You know, if you think about it, if you and I, you know, went off hunting and, and we got ourselves a mammoth and we're sitting there and it's time to eat... The trouble is, is that there are large scavengers and other predators that are coming. So we don't, we, we can't just sit there and go, wow, this is yummy. We got to be eating like this. We got to be looking around, you know, mm. I'm eating this and I'm keeping an eye out. And so we've gotten very good at unconscious eating in order to maintain conscious awareness of the threats around us. Of course, now, you know, people sit around and eat and watch, I don't know, the walking dead you know and they, and they the threats are there but they're not real yeah. but it 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 puts them in that place where they have no real awareness of the food they're eating they don't get to enjoy it a lot and they also miss the satiation point so they overeat and when food was scarce i guess that served us but yeah. now when it's abundant and it's the only barrier is opening the fridge door then it doesn't help us anymore in any yeah. way yeah but you mentioned the seasonal eating there what I'm wondering is how does it affect or how is it different for people who travel, for example? Because Estonia, we're currently in Estonia, it gets cold here, it's getting really cold here. It's going to be winter and a lot of people, including myself, are going to escape somewhere warm, are going to be somewhere else for the winter. How does that factor into seasonal eating? Is it a cycle that we're born with or uh, do we adapt to the uh, environment around us? It's completely separate from the environment around you because you no longer live in the environment that your DNA evolved in. You just don't. We did the vast majority of our evolution in sub-Saharan Africa, and those are the seasons that we evolved for. So, you know, our, we think of this differently. It's not that you have to eat according to the seasons locally around you. It's mm -hmm. that you have to stimulate metabolic modes relative to the seasons that your ancestors lived through. So for example, the fall, the autumn, the metabolic mode for that is energy storage. It's an energy storage system. And if you're in that season, then your body will want to store energy. How do you trigger that season? Well, one of the ways is by eating, you know, significant quantities of carbohydrate foods. Now you eat those carbohydrate foods, you're producing a lot of insulin and your body is trying to figure out how much of it can burn. And once your blood sugar is at a certain level, then it starts storing glycogen, stored energy. And once you're full up of glycogen, you start storing fat, stored energy. That is like, that. that, that is the mode of fall. It's storage mode, it's energy conservation mode. Then equally winter comes along and now you're in serious energy conservation mode because during winter, which should largely have been droughts, there was an absence of food, a real caloric deficit. So at that point, the body wants to almost go into some form of metabolic hibernation, including protein autophagy, because when you've run out of sugar to burn and you've run out of fat to burn, then your body starts burning protein. And everybody talks about that like it's a bad thing, like, oh, the gym trainer, so you don't wanna do that, you'll burn your muscles, you're here at the gym trying to burn. Well, not exactly, because the design of the body is just amazing. Your body knows which proteins to burn. Maybe a silly metaphor for this is like, imagine that you and I and a bunch of our friends were staying in some, you know, old mansion in the north of Norway and a major blizzard goes through and cuts us off from the rest of the world and we run out of oil and all of a sudden the place is freezing. We're going to start burning stuff, right? But we're not going to go grab granny's grand piano and burn that right away. We're going to go grab that old picnic table that somebody broke in 1978 and it's been sitting out there for all that time. We're going to burn the old sick and diseased things first. Well, that's exactly what our body does, right? You go into autophagy, the body goes, don't like that protein, don't like that broken protein and burns them. And this is a really important phase of life that most people never experience and wonder why they end up accumulating a bunch of toxicity and becoming diseased. And, and so each of the seasons has a matching or corresponding mode. When we talk about living through the seasons, what we mean is triggering those modes so that your body gets to do what it's meant to do. Your pancreas, for example, when it's in energy conservation mode, it's producing insulin. 
because that's energy conservation. But when it's in energy release mode, when it's burning fat, then it produces glucagon, two totally different functions, not done at the same time. A lot of people only ever do the one function and wonder why they end up out of balance. So the, the idea is to run through these cycles. In WildFit, do you also pay attention to the quality of the food, as in if it's fast food, if it's grown organic, grown locally, or uh, does that play a role in WildFit? Yeah, food? absolutely. There's no question about it. In fact, in WildFit, we make a distinction that there's food, and then there's junk food, and then there's non-food. But you might be surprised as to what we think junk food is. So there's food. That is food that we have an evolved relationship with, a nutritional requirement for. These are proven foods. Then there are other foods, like say fruit. Fruit, which is, you know, I'm not saying it doesn't serve a purpose, but our ancestors didn't have access to fruit every single day. You might have access to that fruit for a week and then another one for a week. Like that was it. Food, fruit, I should say, is junk food. It's like fast fructose and yummy, but it's really just a bribe. The plant's just bribing you to transport its seeds around. So it's like, come and get me. I'm so bright and colorful and I'm so sweet and yummy. And the fruits weren't in that shape or form back then either. We've... They, they, were, they were a tenth of the size. Even when I was a little boy, strawberries were barely the size of my thumb. Now you can get strawberries that are the size of an apple and apples are the size of the grapefruit and grapefruit's the size of a melon and God knows what they're doing to melons, right? <laughs> so, so on top of that, you now have these Frankenstein versions of, and this is something very important people don't understand about g genetic modification of food. Um, there are three types of genetic modification. There's genetic mod modification through natural selection. That is to say that out there in the world, things are constantly evolving very slowly through natural selection. That's a form of genetic modification. Then you have genetic modification through intentional breeding. That's how we have all the dog species we have today. How, are, how do they look so different in only 10,000? I saw a great cartoon the other day. It's like uh, um, there's a like serious alpha looking wolf out in the woods looking in at man's fire. And the wolf says, one night by the fire, what could possibly go wrong? Next frame, two teacup, tea, teacup chihuahuas. That's what could go wrong. <laughs> but once we start controlling your breeding, we can massively change the species in, in only a few hundred years. But then we have the next version of gen GM, which is like lab altered GM, where we can change something in a single generation. But either way, Fruit is genetically modified, right? It's one of those two forms of genetically modified. Now, I'm not saying fruit's evil. I'm not one of these people that says we should never have it, but it's junk food. Have it occasionally, if ever. Then you've got non-food. Non-food would be like pretty much anything they serve at fast food restaurants, right? Or mm. anything that comes in a package, anything that has ingredients that are you know so multisyllabic that you can't pronounce them, preservatives, E numbers, and all that garbage. It's not food. In your practice, have you observed any uh, effects of, let's say, or do you pay attention also to pesticides and uh, other toxins in foods? Of course. You know, when we first work with clients, our main goal is to keep things as simple and easy as possible. So what that means is, is that as we move them from, say, non-foods to maybe some junk foods into real foods, we also talk to them a lot about the quality of those foods. So let's say, for example, somebody wants to eat meat. And that's a choice that everybody gets to make for themselves. I'm not here to judge that. I'm just, let's say somebody wants to eat meat. Well, I think we can all recognize at this point, there, there is disastrous meat. There is processed garbage, cancer-causing, awful meat. And then you have all the way up to the other end of the spectrum is like perfectly natural meat. You which also one, have seed oil meat now. Well, exactly. So you see, you, you've got this spectrum, right? Yeah. And so, of course, we want to focus on getting the very best quality. But what I've just said about meat is true of broccoli and true mm -hmm. of lettuce and true of whatever. Uh, you know, So uh, the, the, the quality of the food we get is incredibly important. The challenge that we have today is that it's become very popular to um, frighten the hell out of people about uh, you know, uh, insecticides and so forth, which is rightfully so, except for one problem. Now you've got people that feel safer to eat garbage junk processed garbage out of a box because people have frightened them about eating grapes mm -hmm. or, or or vegetables or something so one of the principles that we have in wild food is that your health uh for the most part your health is more dependent upon you getting enough of the good stuff than you avoiding the bad stuff so for example would i rather you starved to death or ate what food you could, risking the fact that there might be some pesticides involved. Well, you're going to have to eat, and that's the present-day reality. It's kind of the same principle there, that if 
you're really unhealthy and you eat one real food one day that doesn't make you healthy. But the same goes the other way around. If you're constantly healthy and like every once in a full moon you allow yourself something yeah. that's a non-food, that's not going to make you completely unhealthy. Exactly right. The body has a tremendous capacity for cleansing and healing. And I'll give you a really great way to describe that is think about this. How long does it take to create type 2 diabetes? It depends. In the 70s, it took 40 years. In the 70s, it would take 40 years of that style of eating to create type. In the 1970s, they even called type 2 diabetes adult diabetes, adult onset, mm -hmm. because kids didn't get it. Now, kids can get it, which says that it takes about 10 years of bad eating today because eating is so much worse today than it was in the 70s. So 40 years of 70s bad eating, you can create type 2 diabetes. Today, you can do it in only 10 years, but you can turn it around in six to eight weeks in most cases. So mm -hmm. think about that. The reason that it takes 10 years to create it is that the body is fighting and trying to heal and it's fighting and trying to heal. And all you have to do is tip the scale slightly back in the body's direction and everything turns back around. Mm -hmm. And it's something that we, uh, Miriam and I at home, some have talked about a lot as well, is the packaging of the food. Because, for example, well, obviously junk food, uh, let's say now non-food, is you buy you buy something from a fast food joint. It's packaged in some sort in some form of a grease-proof packaging, and that contains ton of uh, forever chemicals and phthalates, which will mess up your hormones completely. And it's crazy. And the environment. Exactly, and the environment, and your personal environment and everything. And the downstream effects of these are crazy. And I would almost imagine it's the hormonal damage that you get from the packaging, from your own environment, from your own food, and all of these effects accumulated that are causing these rapid onsets of uh, type 2 diabetes and other chronic diseases. But like from your point of view, like what are the other factors then to, uh, let's say, development of these uh, chronic illnesses or type 2 diabetes specifically besides uh, non-seasonal eatings? And I think of it like this. A gap opened up between our genetic evolution and our ability to innovate. The way evolution used to work for us and still works for animals that are in the wild is that um, you would have this very slow pace of natural selection and a relative level of balance. And then what happened in our case is that we started innovating uh, faster than our genes could keep up with. And you know, one example of that would be that uh, our skin color evolved as a response to our proximity to the equator or more literally our proximity to the sun. So somebody who lived somewhere, somebody who's genetically from, say, Nigeria, evolves very, naturally very, very dark skin in order to block the sun. Somebody like you evolved, you're very Nordic. Nobody has to guess about that. I hope it's not politically incorrect to say, but you're Nordic Nordic. And you evolved to allow the maximum amount of sun in because your ancestors didn't have much access to the sun. They didn't have, they were far away from it. They didn't have that many months of it. So in order to get their basic vitamin D and other needs met, they evolved lighter and lighter eyes, lighter and lighter skin, lighter and lighter hair to let it all come. You know, do you know what, what, do you know what color a polar bear's hair is? It's, it is a trick question. Hmm. I guess it's brown then, is it? It's not. It's, it's, it's not white though either. Yeah. It's translucent. Oh. It's like fiber optics. And so what they've evolved is the capacity to let the sun's rays in like a greenhouse. And to a large degree, you know, if you're very, very Caucasian like you are, and I'm slightly less so, right, you've evolved the ability to let the sun's rays in. Now, now that's all fine. That's evolution. But the gap opens up the minute one of your ancestors got on a boat or got on a plane and flew to somewhere that had a different sun level relative to their skin color. So let's try that on. Like, you know, one of your ancestors, light eyes, light skin, they travel to Nigeria. What's going to happen to them? They're going to burn. They're going to have to be double, triple careful about the sun. Look, we can talk about the fact that if they consume seed oils, it's going to be even worse and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. But I'm just talking pure nature here. They're going to go down there, healthy as can be, they're still going to be like damaged by that sun. So they're going to need to be careful. But equally, 
let's imagine that your ancestor did like some kind of student exchange program with, with, with somebody from Nigeria and they flew up to your Nordic origins and they get up there where there's no sun. What's going to happen to them? They're going to have serious vitamin D problems. They're going to develop rickets and they're going to have all, all kinds of issues. That is the gap. The gap is when our technology allows us to move faster than our genes can come up with or that our genes can respond to. And that's what's happened to us with food, with exercise, with stress. Look, let's imagine uh, we're here in the studio and some, you know, two or three like aggressive drunk guys come busting into the studio and they start threatening us. What's going to happen right away is our heart rate's going to increase. We're going to start producing adrenaline, cortisol, noradrenaline, and that's all designed to coagulate our blood to, in case we get cut or injured to stop us from bleeding out. It's going to cause us to develop strength and speed. It's going to cause our heart to thunder even harder and have more strength so that it can move this new sticky blood around. And it's going to prioritize glucose as the primary fuel source because glucose sugar burns hot. It's a good emergency mm -hmm. fuel. It's going to do all that, which is great if we have to defend ourselves against these guys. Absolutely. But on the other hand, we're sitting here having this interview and let's say a legal process server walks in and says, I have a summons for you. And they hand you a legal document. You produce all the same chemicals. But hang on a second now. How is speed and strength and lack of logic and lack of empathy? How is that going to help you with this legal summons? It's not at all. And so today we have like paleolithic emotions, paleolithic instincts, paleolithic nutritional needs in the current age. And all of those things are contributing to our disease, uh, to, to our disease and to our suffering. Like, just think about this. We live in the safest, arguably the very best times in the world to be a human. We can talk about some of the challenges that the planet has, but I want to remind you, every single generation has at some point in time believed they were going to be the last. It's, it's sort of a generational uh, ritual that each generation seems to go through. But if we just, you know, let that go for a minute, your day-to-day -day life right now, what would what would somebody from 200 years ago pay to live your life today? I guess even royalty didn't have it good enough. A pharaoh of Egypt didn't have it good enough compared to what we've got today, right? Like, it's incredible. We live in the safest, most magical, most best times in the history of ever, and yet antidepressant use, alcohol addiction, and suicide, and all these things are like, what's going on? What's going on is the easier life gets, the harder it becomes to live because we require challenge. And so now what's happening is, is that we have different kinds of stresses and our biochemistry isn't good at those stresses. You get pulled over by a policeman, you see the red and blue lights flashing behind you, suddenly adrenaline, noradrenaline, cortisol, not useful in a police exchange, not at all useful. No release either. No release either. And then you're shaking like crazy after the whole thing is done and you wonder why he thought you looked suspicious. Mm -hmm. So we have these outdated emotional responses to present day stresses and the present day stresses aren't even real comparatively. See, I love this example. Harari put this in his book, Sapiens. He's like, think about it. 200 years ago, if you were a carpenter, if you were a carpenter and you got conscripted or you volunteered to do military service, where do you suppose they would send you? Well, you would think they'd send you to engineering. They'd send you to construction. They'd send you to building things. Nope. If you're a carpenter, they sent you to the medical corps mm -hmm. because the single most common medical procedure at that stage was amputation. Mm -hmm. They needed somebody who knew how to use a saw. And if that isn't shocking enough to compare to our present day, very simple lifestyle, very easy lifestyle, just consider that they neither had antibiotics nor painkillers. 200 years ago, like you, you, it's, it's a different world that we live in now. And we are finding this incredibly easy world really hard to live in. And that is making us sick. What are the most common misconceptions around wild fit that people might have? You know, um, yeah, one of them is that, it, that it's a diet because there is no, you know, there are a lot of people out there that's like, oh, we're the non-diet diet, whatever. And then they go around and they tell people to count their calories or restrict their calories and they just make all the same stupid diet mistakes. We really are not a diet like we are. If you, if you poll our clients, you go talk to our clients that did Wild Fit 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 years ago, they will tell you that they have a um, completely different relationship with food than they did before and not willpower based. They will tell you that even if they've drifted a little here and they've eaten a little of that, that there because Wild Fit is ultimately about freedom, they will tell you that their relationship with food has been permanently altered. And that is what people require these days. They need to change their lifestyle, not go on a diet. I, I think that's one of the most common misconceptions. And then 
Um, you know, another big misconception is that it's like super restrictive. And the truth of the matter is, is that it's only super restrictive if you consider Fruit Loops and Cinnabon to be food. But since those things are not food, they're not actually food, they're, they're, they're not even junk food, they're non-food, then when you start to look at what food really is, when you consider what food really is, no, it's not all that restrictive. In fact, there's a tremendous amount of freedom in, in for example, never being hungry. Like we, we tell our clients like, you should never be starving yourself. You should you should be eating in calorie surplus every day. The idea that calories in, calories out works as a as a weight loss system is absolutely wrong. And so, you know, one of the misconceptions that people have is that it'll be highly restrictive. Now, when we first work with clients, we put them through periods of restriction in a sense like an elimination program where they see their relationship with stuff. But the overall lifestyle that is birthed from that trial by fire is about freedom completely. Yeah, I completely agree with the lifestyle aspect because you have to build habits to make a change, make a long-term change. You can't, well, we talked about willpower before, but you cannot constantly be exercising this willpower 24 seven to make your food choices. You have to build something like start with baby steps because I've, I've used this example in the past myself as well is all of us know somebody who decided that they're gonna go healthy so they joined the gym went on a like a caloric deficit and started training like five times a day but only lasted for maybe like two weeks then gave up and went back to the old habits it, it doesn't work that way yeah. it just doesn't work and yeah. uh, i i like this idea of uh, not using gadgets and gizmos as well because wild fit sounds to me like very uh, it's it's uh, very se sensible in a way that you don't have to do crazy things it's like hey these are the roots this is what you have to do and just like stick to these principles instead of uh, going these elaborate ways and trying to hack your body in like 10 different ways uh, it's it's like building rules and routines instead of using gizmos and gadgets yeah, and I, it, it, we don't ask people to weigh their food. In fact, yeah. we encourage them not to. In fact, encourage them not even to weigh themselves, really. You know, and, and um, you know, we, we really, uh, there's no counting calories, that sort of stuff. I'm like, I'm all for measuring your biometrics and that kind of stuff. I think it's interesting. I think that people can learn a lot about themselves. But, you know, biohacking is such an interesting space. And, and um, my view of biohacking is that, you shouldn't try to do anything like biohacking until you've sorted out your relationship with food. You need to be in balance before you start messing around. Otherwise, you're not really conducting an experiment. It's something that my, this isn't my idea. This is Miriam's idea uh, that I'm conveying here. But it's essentially biohacking is still kind of masking your symptoms. It, like You can go biohack and deal with the root cause. But if you're... Um, she used the example of cycle syncing, uh, cycle, cycle syncing, I think it's yeah, for mm -hmm. women. It's like, wh which day of the cycle should you do which exercises? And her argument was that if you're using cycle syncing because you feel tired at certain times or a period and you're like thinking that, oh, it's that time of the cycle, that time of the month, I cannot go to the gym. You shouldn't feel this way. In, in essence, when you're cycle syncing, you're still using cycle syncing to mask up your symptoms instead of dealing with the root cause. And there's a lot of things in biohacking as well. You can take all these supplements and uh, you think when you avoid certain activities at certain times or like, there, there's a lot of pitfalls there is what I'm trying to say. And it's a lot of the same pitfalls as there is with traditional medicine of not actually dealing with the root cause, dealing with the principles and the issues on or the foundation, let's say. All right, let's consider like say caffeine. Mm -hmm. Should people use caffeine? Well, I would say what they definitely shouldn't do is be used by caffeine. And, and so let, let, let's, let's explore it. Somebody starts with caffeine the first time and what happens? They immediately feel amazing, right? They get this jolt of energy, the adrenaline kicks in and they feel great. And, and then they're like, wow, that felt so good. I want to do that again tomorrow. But after some number of days, what happens is that the caffeine can no longer kick them up as high as it was kicking them up before. In fact, the absence of caffeine has now sucked them lower than they started before. So now they're using caffeine to simply maintain the level of energy that they had before they had caffeine. That's ultimately what happens to people when it comes to caffeine. Now, on the other hand, 
what if your metabolism was locked in? What if you had a really healthy metabolism and you had like burning energy? So I just taught a five-day program here in Tallinn. I'm on stage for that program working deep, deep with people for 15 to 16 hours a day. I am really putting my heart and soul in. And if you were to ask any of the people that are there, they'll tell you they never sensed for a moment my energy flagging in any way. I was there present with them the whole time. Did I use caffeine? Absolutely not. I have a metabolism that generates energy for me like that when I need to do it. I know what season I want to be in from a wild fit perspective to perfect that. And that's what I do. That said, if I had shown up and maybe, you know, I had a bit of a little bit of a jet lag feeling or what have you, and I needed a kick, then I, then I might, I might then, I might biohack at that moment one time. But that's not how m most people are looking at it. And, and that's why I'm saying that. And, and another good example, something like red light, red light therapy. I think mm. there's a place for red light therapy. I think that's absolutely a wonderful thing that exists in the biohacking community. Except for, I know people that have red light saunas and red light therapy and they live in California. I don't understand that in the same way. Go see a sunrise. Yeah, like I'm thinking, <laughs> well, how about the real one? I don't know. I don't know. Give it a, the real one. Let's try that one, you know? So, that, you know, in, in WildFit, our approach to this is, is that if you have a measured deficiency in some area, if you have a measured dysfunction in some area, the first step is to try to address that deficiency or that dysfunction through natural means. That's the first step. If, if somebody's vitamin D deficient, then the first step is to how can I I figure that out. Well, I need to be making sure that I'm eating the right precursor foods that allow my body to manufacture vitamin D. And then I need to be exposing my skin to sunlight. And then I will make vitamin D. Very straightforward. But what if you live in Estonia mm -hmm. or Norway? Now, you might need to look at other ways of dealing with it. Now, I still might want to go natural. I, mean, I still might suggest you call your travel agent. I still might suggest that Greece, the Dominican Republic, and the Bahamas all have free vitamin D pouring down from the sky. But maybe that doesn't work for you. Maybe that's not, you don't have the time and the schedule for that. Then now, having satisfied the natural solutions to your problem, you might need a supplement. Might be time to look at that. But talking about coffee, why is there no caffeine or no coffee in WildFit? It's not that there's no caffeine or no coffee in WildFit. It's that, you know, many of our clients have healthy relationships with, co with coffee. Many of our clients choose to give it up entirely. The distinction is whether or not the coffee is controlling you. That's the distinction. So there are some people like me who just shouldn't have coffee. Like I, I was drinking like, uh, you know, what? I gave up caffeine at 18 years old and, and, and I've never looked back. I, I, I'm grateful for that decision because frankly, caffeine was ruining my life. I, I was basically living my life from one caffeinated drink to the next. If like, as I got to the end of one, I'm like, oh, where's my next one? And I was living like that at 18. So I'm grateful that I gave that up. That said, I have friends. Matter of fact, even my girlfriend, she she enjoys coffee from time to time. It's 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 nice for her, but I don't see her doing it all that often, which means that she gets the full benefit of it when she does it. Look, I also don't have to drink alcohol. It doesn't mean there's no alcohol in WildFit. It's not that at all. Many of our clients have a very nice, healthy relationship with wine, but or whatever. But some people. Not, it's not that easy for them to have that, right? And so if you can't go to bed at night, if you can't get home from work without a pint of beer or having that glass of wine or whatever the case may be, you're not using it anymore. It's using you. Mm -hmm. And that's where we want to draw the line is who's using whom in this situation. So if, if I look, frankly, I have some friends that they're better friends once they've had one glass of wine <laughs> and loosen up. They're, they're a little more fun to be around. But you got to know I'm out of there by the time they had the third glass. Like they, yeah. because then they, then they become objectionable and not even necessarily rude. They just don't listen anymore and they, they, they're, they're slow. And, you know, my view is this biohacking, whether it's because you've taken a little alcohol as a super, social lubricant or you're using red light therapy to top up or you're taking a supplement over here, all of those things can have a place. But the first step is get your body right. Don't use those things to get your body right. Get your body as right as you can first. Last time we talked about coffee, I made a challenge for myself. I wanted to go a week without, and then it was two weeks, three weeks, up to like two, three months. Then I completely forgot about coffee. But I don't know why or how I went back to coffee. I guess it's just the idea of it, having it. But as you mentioned, I feel that my relationship with coffee, maybe after even being off it for three months or what was it, is even better. 
because now when I don't get coffee in the morning, it, it's a routine. I go walk the dog, I grab a coffee, I just like drink it. It's nice and I'm in the office and I just like have one coffee in the morning a day. That That's my max. But when I don't have it, I don't even think about it. And it's just something nice. It's like So what I would suggest then is that um, anything other than air and water that you have every day is probably not a great idea. Mm -hmm. Like our ancestors didn't have that. The only things they had every day, air, water, and movement. That's it. That's the only thing they had every day. Nothing else was every day. Meat wasn't every day. Vegetables weren't every day. Root vegetables weren't every day. Fruit certainly wasn't every day. Honey was definitely not every day. These things weren't. And certainly caffeine wasn't. Mm. And so if you're at the point where you can like not have it and not think about it, then I wouldn't do that every day because every single day that you have it, it blunts its effect and you start developing potential dependency. So I wouldn't do it that way. I would be like, you know what? And and this is the truth. I, I, I mean, I haven't had coffee in 30 years. Okay, I've had one. I was at Dave Asprey's. <laughs> I was at Dave Asprey's place talking bulletproof stuff and he talked me into one cup of coffee. So in 35 years, I've had one cup of coffee. But I don't do that. That said, I have landed in a country having flown you know, halfway around the world and suddenly found I've got to go to a networking event or what have you and I need to be a little bit more on. I've walked into a local place and ordered myself a chai tea. I know full well that's full of black tea and I know that it's going to give me that boost. But I do that maybe three times a year and mm. boy, does it work. But it doesn't work if you do it every day. Yeah. And... Mentioning that caffeine in chai tea, there's so many drinks with hidden caffeine and yeah. it's crazy. Yeah. Let's start wrapping up a bit. It's been super nice, super fun having you on. But one one finishing question here is, what do you think is, is what I'm personally wondering? It's the, This is for my own personal curiosity. What's your relationship to organic foods in a sense that organic is such a buzzword now and you truly don't know if what you're buying is clean and organic anymore. I think something that's really important to realize is that um, a food stamped with organic doesn't mean it's good. Mm. It doesn't mean that. I mean, I've, I've literally seen garbage breakfast cereal, which is pure garbage, stamped organic. And then, of course, the there's a certain you know sect of gullible parents that walk in and go, oh, look, it's organic. I'll just buy that one. With the box being higher in nutritional value than the actual cereal inside. Pretty much. <laughs> and and the box having less glyphosate in it than yeah, the cereal. Definitely. So you have this, this thing where you now can stamp keto on something, and that mm -hmm. means it's good. You can stamp paleo on something, and that means it's good. And you can stamp healthy on something, and that means it's... None of that really is true. So... But but now we have the other problem, and that is the psychosis you can get into if you start worrying too much about this. I've and been down that road. It's tough, right? Yeah. It's tough. You start, you know, I was I was definitely like that. I was like super picky about every damn thing and basically difficult to even be around in public. So then we fall back to one of the wildfire principles. Your health is far more determined by you getting enough of the good stuff than you avoiding the bad stuff. So, so a, a, a box of breakfast cereal that stamped organic on it well there's nothing good about that so i don't want that but now if i'm walking over here and there's a you know let's say say i'm a meat eater and i want to eat this steak and it's not organic well okay i'd rather get the organic one i'd rather get that but i'm not going to deny myself all those amino acids and healthy fats because i couldn't find an organic on that day mm -hmm. i'm going to do the best that i can on any given day so, you know, the, and, and that's where I, I think we have to snap the psychosis and realize that, look, if you're driving along and your car is just about empty of gas and you pull into a really low quality gas station and you've heard they have bad quality gas there, well, what choice do you have? You're mm -hmm. gonna put the gas in. You're just gonna make sure that next time around you put the right gas in. And, and to the point that you and I already discussed earlier today, if you are fundamentally healthy and you occasionally eat something that's dysfunctional, your body has a phenomenal capacity for healing and cleansing. It, it just does. Now, I recognize there are certain chemicals that are really dangerous and we have to avoid them. I, I'm not, I don't mean to diminish that. I'm just saying that the stress of worrying about everything you put in your mouth is probably just about as dangerous as some of those chemicals. So we got to find a balance. What are your travel tricks, travel tips then? Well, you see, once you realize that there's food, junk food and non-food, mm. And then you begin to realize that they don't actually serve food in airports. They do not really. They don't serve food on planes. I will acknowledge now in business class, some airlines serve food in business class now, but in economy, they don't serve food and they don't serve food in the airport. So 
if you think about it like that, imagine you and I were about to go on a trip and in, in the old days, and we knew that it was going to take us, say, 19 hours to do this trip. And we knew that it was through the dark forest and there was no, you know, there was no food in the dark forest. What would we do? We prepare. Food. We'd pack some food. So when I travel, I pack food. I, I stop when I'm here in Thailand. I go to the bio market. My favorite one happens to be the one in Baltiyama. I go there. I get some travel food, right? I, or 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 I go to. There's another little market in the in Baltiyama where they've got dried meats and stuff. I go in and get some of that. So now I'm going to travel with my own food, just like I would have done 100 years ago, instead of relying on the, the food dealers <laughs> that are that are in the way. And then the other thing is to do research. So so here's a good example. Let's say that you and I are headed off to, I don't know, what's a city? I, that I, it's hard to think of a city you've never been to and you've been to so many, but we can think, we can come up with one. I've uh, Let's see, I've never been to Detroit. Okay, so let's say you and I are going to Detroit. Well, we know they don't serve food between here and Detroit, right? We know that. Mm -hmm. So we're going to pack our own food. And, and, and by the way, if we happen to be in business class and we find, oh, look, they did have food, great, great. But let's not take a chance on that and bring our own. But now, before we even get on the plane, I'm going to be looking. I'm, I, I will find, before I get there, where I can shop for good quality food. I will find the restaurants that likely serve the best quality food. I'm going to find that out before I get there. Because one thing that I've really recognized about food psychology is that the hungrier you get, the more flexible you become about your food rules. You could be the healthiest person ever, but if you get hungry enough, you'll scarf down a chocolate bar. You know, it'll, it'll happen if you're hungry enough. So what I don't want to do is travel like 20 hours to somewhere, get there super hungry and not have ideas about where to go. So those are very important travel hacks to me. Oh, one other one is, uh, you know, I'm very lucky for me because we've got basically there's wildfitters in every city around the world. So I just post and go, I'm going to be in this town and I need somebody to feed me. And uh, my <laughs> tribe comes together and the next thing you know, I'm sitting down having the best wildfit meal I could. So that's why I built wildfit. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, this is something that Miriam and I do as well is every time we travel, we have an extra bag that's just full of li like these travel snackies yeah. and travel yeah. foods. And it, it really comes in handy. But yeah. usually there's a problem on the way back. Well, yeah. if you've done the research Fair enough. where you are, then there doesn't ne necessarily need to be a problem on the way back. Yeah. And the other thing is, look, let's be honest, is that if you have a balanced metabolism, not eating for a day or two actually isn't a problem. This is something that I wanted to ask quickly as well is if there's no options, is then no options better than some options? Is it better to not eat at all and fast for uh, 12 hours, 24 hours or something? It depends on your metabolic health. Um, if you are not metabolically healthy, then no, that really won't work for you because your body is so conditioned to burning sugar as a primary fuel source. So now if you just suddenly deny it sugar, mm -hmm. you're going to crash. You're going to crash. You're going to get dizzy. You're going to pass out potentially. You're going to be moody and grumpy. It's going to make for a horrible time. On the other hand, if you have a healthy metabolism that's able to switch modes, right, to go from, from you know, the, the, the sugar mode to the not sugar mode to burning fat, then you have this indefinite supply of energy and eating becomes rather more optional. You begin to realize that the way it's supposed to work is that my meal on Monday is actually not here to give me energy on Monday or Tuesday. It's here to give me energy next Monday mm -hmm. or even a few Mondays in the future. So if you have a healthy metabolism, it means you decide to go on a trip. You're like, well, I'm just not, I don't need to eat during that time because I'm, I'm, I'm going to burn fat and I'm going to go. And I've routine, I've done that often. In fact, I fasted my way up Kilimanjaro once on that basis. I've, I've done Kilimanjaro seven times. And on one of the trips, I just thought, you know what? I talk about this. I want to find out if it's really true. And so after the first two days of climbing, I stopped eating. Luckily, my guides knew me really well because I'd done the mountain so many times. So, because mm. if a normal guest stops eating, they won't let them climb. Because they're on the belief that you have to eat to maintain your energy. I said, no, I, I, I don't, I'm going to be fine. It was the easiest summit experience I had by far. Like it was, it made it go from being one of the hardest things I've ever done to being a literal walk in the park, like whistling as I walked. I had tons of energy because I wasn't wasting energy digesting. Mm -hmm. I wasn't putting in short, hot burning fast sugar fuels and I was burning steadily 
the pre-existing fat that I was storing on my body. That's awesome. I've had a similar experience with sports competitions. And when I went in fasted, I did way better than yeah. I went in with having eaten beforehand. Yeah, like, look, if you're a boxer and you want to take somebody down in round one or round two, eat a bunch of sugar. Go for it. If you're convinced you can knock them down, the sugar will give you explosive energy. Get, you know what? Top it up with some caffeine too. Have a serious sugar <laughs> caffeine bomb walk in on the first round. But if you do not take them down in that first round, you're screwed. You're screwed, especially if they're a fat burner because they can do 15 rounds and you're going to be toast. And that's how it is. If you use sugar as your primary fuel source, your sugar, your, your energy will come in, in fits and starts. If you use fat as your primary fuel source, your energy just burns beautifully. Are there any closing remarks or asks or uh, anything else you want to share with the audience before we finish up? Well, I, I would just say this, that um, it doesn't really matter what, people want to achieve in the world. If they want to be the best parent, they want to be the best husband, wife, they want to be the best child, they want to be the best business owner, most successful, they want to write books, make movies, launch a podcast. It doesn't matter what you want to do in the world. The most valuable investment you can make in your success in any endeavor is to have a healthy body and balanced metabolism. That's it. And so I would just suggest that people learn about that because your doctor didn't. Your doctor didn't learn about that. Your doctor never learned about that. You can ask your doctor yourself. In the six or eight years you went, he or she went to medical school, the question I have is how, how much of that time was spent studying food? None. Like none of it. And so that, what that says to me is it's a little like, it's like nobody's flying this plane. I better learn how to fly. And I think everybody better learn how to fly. Everybody better begin to develop their own understanding of nutrition and, and, and take charge of their health because the food manufacturers don't give a damn about your health. They care about their profits. And the pharma pharmaceutical industry is no better. Yeah. Eric and Meads, thank you for joining us. Thank you for sharing all these thoughts and wisdom. Check out WildFit at getwildfit.com. Definitely check out Eric's Speaker Academy because you can see how the presence of Eric just here, <laughs> which is which is what I've always admired, especially your stage presence. I'm I'm gonna have to take your Speaking Academy one day. Gonna get some experience first. And um, is there any other resources or links you wanna direct people to? For those people who are interested in communication and improving their general communication, uh, we have a free membership at speakernation.com where they can find out lots of stuff about public speaking and that sort of thing. And and if people have follow-up questions, you know, come and find me on Instagram. I, I manage my own page, it's not an agency, and I do my level best to answer the DMs that people send me. And that's super easy, it's just at Eric Edmeads. Awesome, thank you so much for coming. And uh, till next time. Thanks for having me.